In this video, I'm going to answer your questions about multiple sclerosis. Don't turn away because that starts right now. Hey! Howdy. Thanks for learning about MS with me, Aaron Boster. I'm the founder of the Boster Center for Multiple Sclerosis, where we care for families impacted by MS from around the globe. H. Goldilocks writes, question, Ocarus infusion this week. Would love to get my third COVID vaccine booster. Recommendations on timing. That's a tough one because we don't really have a lot of data. Logic might suggest that waiting towards the second half of that six month period. So you get your Ocarus infusion, then you have six months before your next one. Waiting at least three months seems like a reasonable idea. And then making sure that you get your vaccine at least a month prior to your next infusion also seems reasonable. This would seem like the best window. I don't know that we have data to prove that makes sense, but just based on logic, that's probably my recommendation. Portuguese Beauty writes, am I likely to have a relapse after a COVID vaccine? And the answer is no, you are not likely to have a relapse. I'm not saying it's impossible, but I do want to point something out. I would feel that you're more likely to have a relapse triggered by having COVID than you are likely to have a relapse triggered by a COVID vaccine. So either way, I think it's in your favor to get vaccinated. D Barber asks, hey, think we all want your thoughts on third vaccine. I recommend that you get a booster. Let me say it again. I strongly encourage you to get a COVID-19 vaccine booster. If you're someone impacted by MS, it would be a great idea to get a COVID vaccine booster. I'm gonna get a COVID vaccine booster. I'm recommending that my patients get a COVID vaccine booster, and I'm very likely to recommend that you would benefit from a COVID vaccine booster. Now, of course, the disclaimer, you have to talk to your doctor about what's right for you, but my opinion is it's a really good idea. Slavko asks the question, low testosterone in MS, any correlation to prognosis? And the answer is yes. I think it's important that men with MS have their testosterone checked. And if they're found to have two consecutive low testosterones in the morning, then I'm concerned that they have low T and we need to supplement it. Why? Because there's actually data that suggests that men with low T can have a faster progression of neurological disability. They can get worse faster than if they didn't have low T. And men with MS with low T can have increase in cog fog, increase in depression, and they can have difficulties in the bedroom. All things that we would like to make better. Bluthden asks, is there a difference with secondhand smoke versus firsthand smoke affecting MS? I do know that there's evidence that both smoking cigarettes and secondhand smoke increases the risk to develop MS and can speed up MS. And so I think both are bad. And I would probably recommend avoiding both. Italo asks, hey doc, do you reckon 10 non-enhancing lesions in the brain are too many at time of diagnosis? There's actually a really great study that looked at people with clinically isolated syndrome, so the very first clinical attack, and they looked at how many spots they had on their brain, and then they followed them 20 years. Really cool study. And what they found suggested that the more spots that you have on your brain at the time of diagnosis correlates with worse disability downstream. So having 10 spots at diagnosis is in fact worse than having five. E asks, please share your opinion about IVIG as maintenance therapy. Now, IVIG is intravenous immunoglobulin. So in English, it's a bag of pooled antibodies from donors. It's been cleaned, it's sterile, and it's infused in your arm through your vein. And it's typically done uh, for several days in a row as a loading dose, and then say once every month or so as a maintenance dose. And it has been shown in some small studies to work to improve outcomes in relapsing multiple sclerosis. It's not FDA approved and it's very, very expensive. And as a result here in the United States, it's very hard to get it paid for by third party payers. Joe Bonnie asks, what about lady bits? So I'm assuming this question has to deal with, I divide my thoughts into sort of three categories when thinking about sexual dysfunction in women with MS. First is arousal or libido. Uh, do you feel sexually interested? Uh, do you become aroused or sexually excited when you would expect to? And if the answer is no, then we need to dig in and figure out why. Oftentimes I uncover undertreated depression or anxiety, or I uncover other concerns which we can work on to improve that piece. There's actually medicines to improve that as well. There's a prescription drug called Addy, A-D-D-Y-I, which can help with female libido, uh, there's even a compound that I've only recently learned about that a urologist can prescribe. It's an injection called PT-141. The point is, if we identify issues with libido in women, we don't have to just idly sit by and say, well, that's too bad. 
Now, the second thing that I think about is lubrication. Which, physiologically, is the female equivalent of a male erection. So if there's an issue with lubrication, we can look into that. We can look at hormone levels and see if they're out of whack. We could also use a water-based lubricant or a topical estrogen cream to the vulva. So there's a lot of ways of overcoming issues with lubrication. Lastly, and arguably most importantly, is ability to achieve orgasm. And sometimes it can be insanely difficult to achieve orgasm. Sometimes it can be impossible. We call that anorgasmia. And there's a lot of different things that we can do in that situation. For example, I will prescribe a compounded cream, aptly called Scream Cream, which contains uh, medicines like theophylline, which bring blood flow to an area, and even Viagra. And what these do is they enrich and engorge the vulva tissue and can increase sensitivity. Scream Cream. I recommend water-based lubricants, as you can imagine. And we can use the vibrator trick, plug in the wall vibrator. Coupled with a water-based lubricant, increasing skin sensitivity, you can provide overdrive stimulation to the down there's, adequate to send a message up through the spinal cord to the brain so that the brain finally figures out what's the plan and can help with achieving orgasm. This is an important topic and all too often it's ignored, either because it's embarrassing to the human being who's having the problem or it's embarrassing to the neurologist listening to the problem. However, it's treatable and it's a major determinant in quality of life. And so I hope that if you're listening to this and you have trouble in the bedroom, that you'll reach out to your doc so that you can seek out a solution. One more pro tip before we move on to another topic, and that is pelvic floor physical therapy. Pelvic floor physical therapy is amazing. Pelvic floor physical therapist typically only has to meet with you once or twice. They get up in your business and put you up in stirrups and they activate and retrain your pelvic floor. And I can tell you that many, many of my patients have gone to pelvic floor PT and had remarkable benefits, not just to bowel and bladder, but also in the bedroom. Aaron Reed asks, what is the best thing for foot drop? So the front of your leg pulls your foot up and then your calf pushes it back down. So you can have a situation where these muscles are weak and your foot literally drops. And that can be a problem because then you can't clear the ground when you're walking and your toes can catch on the ground and you can stumble and fall. And unfortunately, a foot drop is not uh, an uncommon phenomenon when there's been spinal cord damage from multiple sclerosis. So one thing that can help with foot drop is physical therapy. And I think anyone who has foot drop benefits from working with a physical therapist. Uh, oftentimes they can help out a bunch. There are several assist devices which are awesome for foot drop. One that I like a lot is purchased on Amazon, doesn't require a prescription. It's called a foot flexor. And it's basically a, a elastic band that you put around your ankle, like with Velcro, and then an elastic band down to your shoelaces, which just cocks your foot up. And you can put it on pretty tight and you can push your foot down, but it helps pull it back up and it helps you clear the ground. Also, you can have ankle foot orthosis, or an AFO, and this is a super lightweight uh, carbon fiber material item, which is shaped kind of like an L, and it fits inside your shoe and up the back of your calf, and then straps on the bottom part of your leg, and keeps your foot bent, and that way your foot can't flop, and it doesn't grab the ground. There are some super cool electronic devices, uh, like a Bioness, these are electrical devices that actually use electricity to stimulate the anterior tibialis muscle to, to pop your foot up, and you can uh, learn how to use them with walking and recreate proper gait mechanics. The downside is they're extremely expensive and insurance typically doesn't cover them. Those are a couple things that you can do to work on foot drop. Sharon Grossman asks, what about peeing during sex, even though you went to the bathroom beforehand? And so this is not uncommon. And we may have a situation where the bladder neck is really, really tight. So you may have a bladder that's full of urine and you go to urinate before intercourse or any other time and some urine comes out, but not all the urine comes out because the bladder neck's really tight. So it's like trying to get fluid through a swizzle straw. Then during the act of intercourse, particularly during escalation towards orgasm, the entire pelvic floor is spasming and the bladder is spasming and it can squirt the urine out. So one thing that you can do is you can intermittent self-cath. You can learn how to insert a small rubber catheter into the urethra, drain the bladder utterly and completely prior to intercourse, and take the catheter back out. You can do this in the bathroom, just before sex, and then you know your bladder is empty. And that way, during intercourse, as you escalate towards orgasm and your bladder is spasming, you won't wet yourself. So Joe asks, my lymphocyte count is low. What should I do so I can boost my immune system so that I can do year two of Mavenclad? So let's unpack this complex question. So Joe has taken Mavenclad, which is 
a discontinuous therapy. You take a pill once a day for five days in a row, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Then you wait a month without any other medicine. So it's like a reverse birth control pill. Then on the second month, you do that again, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And then you're done for the entire first year. You just take 10 pills in that first year. Then a year later, you repeat the process, a pill a day for five days the first month, then the second month, a pill a day for five days. But you don't start the second year's worth of medicine if your lymphocyte count hasn't come back up above 800. And so in this situation, Joe is sharing that he took the first year of Mavenclad and now it's time for the second year, but his counts aren't back yet. His white count isn't where it's supposed to be. And so what do you do? Well, I would not recommend taking medicine to boost the immune response because that's kind of like the wrong direction. In the setting of MS, you have an overly active immune response and we take medicines like Mavenclad to push them down. We wouldn't want to do something to boost it up because that could actually make MS disease activity much worse. What I would want to do is I would want to allow the lymphocyte count with time to slowly come back. And I would anticipate that if it's not back at the end of the first year, we simply need to wait longer for it to come back. And from an MS standpoint, I have to tell you that that's not a bad thing. Having a suppressed immune response, having a low lymphocyte count from an autoimmune perspective is super helpful. It's actually a very useful way of treating the condition. Now I'm making this video in October, 2021 during an ongoing global viral pandemic. And obviously there are concerns about having a low lymphocyte count in the setting of risk for infection. And so it would be my desire that Joe would be vaccinated against COVID-19 and would have a vaccine booster, would wear a mask and would stay out of the fray while he has his low lymphocyte count, letting it come back to normal. Then when the lymphocyte count got up above 800, we would talk about starting the second year. Good question. Melissa writes, I would like to make an appointment with you. Can you reach out to me? Well, Melissa, that's awesome. And I'd love to see you. So check us out on the web at bostermms.com, B-O-S-T-E-R-M-S.com, or call the clinic up at 614-304-3444, and we'll help get you sorted and get you scheduled in clinic. See you soon.